I don't like to stand on stage, I like to walk about. So, we've been hearing a lot about what Node can do. We've been hearing a lot about what we can do. We've been hearing a lot about what we can do that kind of takes control away from the previous players. And I'm going to so sort of end this uh, conference on the note that they're not going to give that up without a fight. But they won't see the fight even coming before it's too late. So, I'm Rick Falkvinge. On Twitter, I'm, um, I'm known as Falkvinge, and I love seeing my name on Twitter. So, whenever I say something really bright or something awfully stupid, let me and the world know. Uh, for your convenience, I've spammed every single slide with my Twitter alias, so you won't, it won't matter if you forget it. A quick introduction. I f let's begin with, how many in here have heard of the Swedish Pirate Party? Let's see a show of hands. I'd say that some half to two-thirds, roughly, which, funnily enough, is so constant across the world that I can confidently put it in the slides, and it comes true no matter where I go. So, just for kicks then, how many in here have heard of any other Swedish political party? Let's see a show of hands. One, two, three, four, five, yeah, six. <laughs> Same thing there. And I think that's kind of funny, that tells you something. That tells you something that there's an underbrush, there's an undergrowth happening here, worldwide, that the establishment is quite unaware of. So, as a quick introduction to myself, I founded the first Pirate Party in 2006. We put two people in the European Parliament out of Sweden's 20. We did that on a budget of less than 1% of our competition. We had a campaign budget total of 50,000 euros. Our competition had 6 million. And we became the largest party in the um, most coveted demographic of voters below 30 years of age. And it's now spread to just over 50 countries. Today, I'm traveling and speaking. I'm, uh, work, I'm working with a, uh, an organization known as European Pirate Academy. It's a newly formed nonprofit that's taking the experience we've had from pirate parties, net liberty activists, and repackaging the, this in order to spread it across the world in terms of the cost efficiency I mentioned, leadership, in terms of communications and organizational agility we can repackage and spread it to the rest of the world, and in particular to corporations and governments who frankly have <laughs> not a clue about what, what's been discussed over these past two days. So, on to the topic at hand. But I'd like to give you a little heads up that I'll be asking for a quick evaluation at the end of this presentation. It's going to be very simple, just an informal show of hands, for three colors, red, red, yellow, or green, where it's just below expectations, on expectations, or above expectations. And since that, that's market speak, let's just call it ba, me, and yay. So what's the deal anyway? What's the observation that can actually create a new political party? What's the observation that makes this party spread to over 50 countries and take seat after seat in national, international, and state-level parliaments. Well, it's kind of easy. Imagine a letter 40 years ago, a letter that our parents sent in the mail. It had certain properties. It was anonymous. You and you alone would determine if you identified yourself as sender of this letter on the out outside of the envelope for the entire world to see, usually on the reverse side, on the inside on the letter, only for the recipient to know, or frankly, not at all. This was quite enshrined in communications as a concept. The letter was secret in transit. 
Nobody had the right to open this letter to see if it contained a crime. You could obtain a warrant to, to search for evidence of a previously suspected crime in a letter, but you could never open all of it on pure routine. It was untracked. Nobody had the ability, nor frankly the right, to track who was talking to whom. And obviously the mailman was never responsible for the contents of a message. It was sealed, he had no right to know what was in it, therefore he was not responsible for it. And our observation and our demand is that it is completely reasonable that our children have the exact same rights that our parents had in the environment that they communicate in. That is not unreasonable in, in any way, shape or form. Now, when you say this, some people will protest, notably the copyright industry, who will say that you can't allow anybody to send anything to anybody else. We can't make money if you allow that. And I say, so what? An entrepreneur's role in society is to make money given the current constraints of technology and society itself. They do not get to dismantle civil liberties, even, and perhaps especially if, they can make money otherwise. So, we're seeing a worldwide crackdown on this very simple principle that our children should have the same rights as our parents when they communicate. Worldwide politicians are cracking down on this, pushed on by various special interests, and only the excuses differ. They're using locally acceptable excuses to crack down. In Middle East, you can usually hear sanctity of the prophet or something like that. In China, it's stability or morality of the nation. Here in the uh, West, you typically hear one or a combination of four excuses, which are terrorism, child porn, organized crime, and file sharing. Any one of those can be used to justify our children's rights to communicate with the same level of privacy that our parents did. And it goes kind of beyond that when you have clueless politicians. In April of this year, there was a bill introduced in Arizona. The number and denomination doesn't really matter, but what it was about said that it would make it illegal, criminal, to upset people online. So, when I go to my favorite fantasy forum and describe this latest trip to Dublin, and say how I saw Fellowship of the Ring, Two Towers and Return of the King in the book stand at the airport. And I go all outraged about how this magnificent trilogy, this masterpiece, has become a book. <sighs> and how Hollywood absolutely needs to wring every last cent of profit out of these art forms. And then I kind of just lean back for the enjoyment and bring out the popcorn and see what happens. There are politicians who want to make this illegal, which obviously is a problem, because this kind of pranking has always happened. So let's take a look at the history. We have a history of control in human society, but we also have a history of sharing, of community, which is what we all feel here. This conference opened with an insight into primate collaboration, and I'd like to carry on that. In terms of sharing, how we started about 500 years ago to understand the benefits of sharing information. When I speak to sociologists about the net, they generally divide into two groups. 
The first group says that the internet is the largest invention of mankind since the printing press about 600 years ago, 1453. The second group disagrees with this and says that no, it is not the largest invention since the printing press. It is the largest invention since the written language 6,000 years ago. And that kind of puts things into perspective as to what we're building right here, right now. Before the printing press, the Catholic Church had a monopoly on knowledge and culture. They had a monopoly on the truth. They could dictate true from false. And at that time, in that era, monks were laboriously copying books by hand. It took months, if not years, at astronomical costs to produce a duplicate of a single book. In this era came the printing press. The Catholic Church was enraged at how everybody and anybody was suddenly copying and sharing thoughts, ideas, poems, novels, stories, discussions. And they were. All of a sudden, the middle class had gotten a voice. It didn't cost 300 animal skins and one year of a monk's time to get an idea into the public. And remember now, the church didn't see themselves as evil here. They saw it as a problem that others were spreading misinformation in society. And they saw it as their task to set things right again, to return to stability, to return to the status quo. They had become so ingrained with the idea that they were the sole interpreters of truth, that they were incapable of understanding the concept of many voices. And as a result, penalties for using the printing press increased gradually over Europe as the church lobbied kings, queens, and courts across Europe for harsher penalties. Until on January 13, 1535 in France, it hit the death penalty for using a printing press. To the church's absolute horror, even the death penalty did not deter unauthorized copying. Even the death penalty didn't help against unauthorized copying. This was the run-up to another mechanism which was successfully used to persecute political speech, which was called copyright. It was created on May 4, 1557 by Queen Mary I in England to, uh, to persecute Protestants. She, she wanted England to return to Catholicism. She died one year later, so she didn't succeed in her, her quest, but her sister, Elizabeth I, who succeeded her, happily took over this mechanism and used it to persecute Catholics instead. So you can see that power kind of begets power, and there's a red thread here. If you can dictate true from false, then you control the world. The Catholic Church, pre-printing press, had no reason to ever fear a law being made against them, because they controlled the lawmaker's impression of what was in the public interest and what wasn't. If you can dictate true from false, you can be a living God on the planet as far as everybody else is concerned. This is the greatest power any man, anybody in mankind can ever have. And we'll be returning to how important that is, how important this authority is. What we see as a red thread going through history here is that people in power use their power to keep their power. That is thoroughly consistent. And all of this, which we see right now before us, with these conflicts, with this conflict between centralization, decentralization, power, not power, power to the people, power to the parliament, power to the corporations, 
All of this has happened before, and I'm willing to bet that all of this will happen again. Now, this happens to be a Battlestar Galactica quote, but that doesn't make it any less false. Con when you look at control versus sharing in history, you have many examples of this. You had the first printed cotton fabrics, pre-revolution France, where the king sold monopolies on printing certain patterns to the nobility, which then wanted to sell these rights, these copies to the common folk. And these fabrics happened to be very popular, particularly for, make, for making dresses. So everybody copied, completely disregarding the monopoly of the nobilities. As a result, predictable as a grandfather of a clock, the nobility went to the king, asked for harsher penalties for those who dared defy the monopolies that they had paid good money for until it hit not just death penalty, by death, but death penalty by torture. Death penalty by breaking on the wheel, as it, it was called. It was a very tortured, torturous method of executing somebody, where you would break all the bones in their body and then weave what was left of it into a wheel, on a wagon wheel, hang the rest of it up and leave them to die. It usually took about three days and they would die from thirst. Everybody in France, in most villages, knew somebody who had been executed for copying. It didn't make a dent in copying as a phenomenon. Our sharing gene runs deep. We are prepared to defy the most horrific constructs to share with our fellow human beings. And history goes on and on and on with examples like this. Newspapers, again, control of information. When newspapers hit large scale, scholars and society at the time were upset because it had been their privilege to determine what was in the public interest, what was the special interest, and how would society be formed? How would society be shaped? And all of a sudden, newspapers came with the voices of the riffraff. Who could possibly want to hear that? How would ordinary people from the pub possibly understand what was needed in society? It turned out that this was quite a positive move for society overall to allow new voices. Allow new voices. That is key to what is happening right now, and I'll be returning to that. Another example of control, a red flag that happened mid-1800s again in, in, um, around, in and around London. When the automobile was new, although it wasn't necessarily called that at the time. It was welcomed with open arms with everybody, as happens when thing, things are new. People took it, took it into their harm, hearts, into their homes, and no, they didn't. This was something that scared people. It, it was noisy, it was new, and people did not understand how to handle it. And it scared horses which became the perfect excuse for not perhaps banning it, but regulating it. So there was something called a Red Flag Act in 1865, which regulated every automobile to have a crew of three people. Crew. The driver, a stoker, essentially a machinist, and a person waving a red flag walking in front of the car. What this did was effectively that it limited the utility of the car to walking speed. And it turned out much later, right, you could only use it to safely and slowly transport people and cargo to stagecoach and railroad stations. And it turned out much later that these were also the industries that had been lobbying for this law to come into effect. Again, 
if you control the truth, if you control the truth, you control the perception of the public interest. As the um, as everybody was copying freely laws, laws coming out of London at that time, you saw many laws like this elsewhere in the world. I think Pennsylvania was actually my favorite, which had a bill, it didn't pass, but they had a bill saying that anybody in an automobile seeing cattle or horses further up on the road must immediately stop the vehicle, disassemble it, and hide all the parts in the nearest brush. <laughs> and wait until the animals have passed. This law didn't pass, but the, the mere fact that somebody can write a bill like this and still be taken seriously kind of tells you what, what it looked like. Then the copyright industry, of course. This is one of my pet peeves since I'm from the Pirate Party. When libraries at first appeared, they were private. They were rich folks who had vast arrays of books and just started lending books to people who wanted to read, to people who were thirsty for knowledge, for culture, for stories, for novels, for ideas. And at some point, the uh, powers that be, the politicians, realized it would, would, was maybe not that great idea to have rich people on their own determine who got access to knowledge. So the idea of public libraries appeared in a bill before Parliament in 1849. At this point, the, public, uh, the, the copyright industry had been advocating for banning lending of books. Obviously, you can't allow somebody to read a book without paying for it first. If, uh, when this idea of public libraries came, on, uh, came up on, on the table, they went absolutely stratospheric. You can't allow anybody to read any book without paying. Nobody would, would be able to make a living off of writing books ever again. If you pass this law, not a single book will ever be written ever more. But Parliament saw it in the public interest to not have rich people control knowledge. So they passed the law of public libraries in 1850. And as we all know, not a single book has indeed been written ever since. The copyright industry went on. They, they have this kind of disaster proclamation every five or ten years, starting, uh, or rather continuing, in 1905 with the self-playing piano and the gramophone, which would be the end of a vivid, songful humanity. End quote. You have the broadcast radio, which was disastrous for the record industry, as was loud, loudspeakers. Television would be the end of cinema, because who would possibly pay to see a movie when they could watch it at home for free? Cable television was equally unfair, needed to be banned, because who could possibly compare it with paid content when, when they had to supply it for free? All of a sudden, the reverse argument was equally true. And so on, and so on, and so on. Page two. So what we're coming down to here is a pattern where those who have had a centralized control of information and culture see it for the power position that it is in society and how it is our task to break that. How is it, it is our task to celebrate that the internet and the One Laptop a Child program gives a nine-year-old schoolgirl in Paraguay a voice and the ability to contribute to the largest collection of human knowledge, Wikipedia, at the same level as everybody else. I think that's beautiful, but the, the powers that be thinks that's very, very scary. Governments see this for the control it is. If you're looking at the Arab Spring last year, you can look at ex-president Mubarak, for instance, and how he reacted to people starting to plan things over this strange thing called the net. He went to a couple of choke points in Egypt and shut down the entire thing. 
Now, you have to ask yourself, what was this guy thinking? If he wanted to keep people indoors and not rioting, so yeah, it's probably ID to take away all their games and porn. Not the brightest bulb in the, on the continent, I have to say. But moving on to, okay, so what's going on here? Let's take a look. Now that the pat, we've looked at the pattern, let's try to peek into the crystal ball and see just how far we've come on this disruption. Because I would argue that we haven't come anywhere near where we think we are in this change. And as an argument for that, I'm going to look at, disruption takes time, and I'm going to look at factories, and specifically, electricity. It used to be the factories were built like this. You'll all see, I think even this, the plant we're in right now is an example of that. Five or six stories, typically downtown, down by the water. And the reason for that was quite simple the buildings were optimized for steam power. Steam power. Then came electricity. Everything that was steam powered was just replaced by something electricity powered. But people had forgotten that the reason factories were built like this was because of the steam power in the first place. They just knew that this is how you build a factory. From the point where half of the factories were electrified, it would take 60 years until somebody came up with the idea that you could almost triple the efficiency by building flat outside of the city center. Six zero years. Which, of course, begs the question, what assumptions are we running on today? What do we take so for granted that you do it this way and don't see that it's because of an assumption that's been lost over the generations because we've taken so, so for granted, like steam power? Well, obviously we don't know that. But let's take a couple of teasers, shall we? We have, obviously, the postal services who ignored email and are now pretty much relegated to just shipping boxes and the occasional bill that hasn't been that has not yet moved entirely onto the net you have new services we which still have a large audience but they are getting increasingly replaced by social media blogging and this everybody has a voice concept. And they are still ridiculing blogging, as in don't have time to do proper research, don't have time to write stories, don't have the reputation, when time and again it turns out that news services are largely just propagating press releases and it's the bloggers that are actually doing the research, with few exceptions. The copyright industry, obviously, who are trying to say that they are protecting the content when in reality what they are protecting is the implicit container, which is not there any longer, because art, ideas, texts, sound, video flows freely. There used to be a container around it, there isn't any more, but by pretending there is one in language, and in the halls of Brussels and Washington DC, regulation can continue to pretend this for another while longer. Banking, that's an interesting one. How many here have used Bitcoin or another cryptocurrency? Let's see a show of hands. Okay, scattered hands. So, a quick rundown on what Bitcoin is, is that it's a construction of something scarce on the, on the net that exists only in a limited amount, specifically 21 million bitcoins, and that can be transferred 
almost in instantaneously to anywhere on, on the globe. So it becomes a currency. It becomes a currency that you can trade. You can exchange it for US dollars, for euros, and so on. And the first time I transferred the value of a cup of coffee to a friend in India on a Sunday, and my friend had the money instantly. I felt like I took a leap 40 years into the future until I realized it's the banks that are stuck 40 years in the past. For looking at this, what are, they, what are banks doing today? They are taking on the order of 5% off of every transaction. Could be 2%, could be 3%, could be sometimes more, but on that order. And additionally, charges a fixed fee per year, plus when we compare to the free services today, just to sort of set the bar for what we expect in terms of information services. What's free today? You have an encyclopedia, Wikipedia, which we go to every so often to look up anything we have. Well, it wasn't long ago that Bri Encyclopedia Britannica was kind of the epitome of knowledge in the world. That's not true any longer. We can instantly sh search any, well, any document in existence instantly worldwide, which if you try to explain that to somebody from 30 years ago, they would not understand what you were saying. We can store an infinite amount of data for free. Most webmail services today, or rather Yahoo started that, are offering infinite storage per account, which economically puts the price for infinite data at exactly free. So let's compare that with what banks and, of course, publish. Bank, what banks, the services banks provide are they keep a number in a database and handle maybe 12 messages a month for us and charge this amount of money. So you can observe that there's a slight disparity and, if I might say, opportunity for disruption. Telco industry. When I have 10 or 100 general purpose megabits in a jack in the wall, why would I pay a euro per minute for a 9.6 kilobit connection that can only be used for a voice application? The business model is just dead. And the profit margin that the telcos are charging today is, well, in a, in a healthy functioning market, a profit margin can typically be about five, maybe upwards of six, seven percent. On roaming data, the profit margin is, and I'm not making this up, one million percent. Which, tell, which tells you that there's something, something fishy going on here. And this is just what we can see today. But let's take another leap. In the, in the final minutes of this conference, let's take another leap and see what, what we can really change. I mentioned that I think that banks are in the danger zone because of cryptocurrencies. But cryptocurrencies are decentralized. They are sitting in the form of cryptographic keys on your computer. Governments depend on the ability to apply violence to enforce, on be of enforce obedience, for example, with tax collection. But not even a ton of TNT applied to a computer will give them those crypto keys. Governments stand at the brink to lose their ability to collect taxes and to look into individuals' income wealth and expenditure. That's going to be a popcorn moment. Right. Six disruption. Governments. This is going to be a popcorn-style scenario. And as a final observation, I started out by observing that the ability to dictate true from false is the greatest authority somebody in humankind has ever had. Authority itself 
is now getting disrupted. We've lived in a permission society where you needed permission from everything from taking a shit to publishing ideas. The generation growing up today is not taking that. They're expecting to communicate with the entire world and to get feedback and to share without asking anybody. And the, the reason that we've lived in a permission society is that authority was sold. It was not always sell, sold for money, but it was sold in exchange for obedience with the system. I think most of us here have college degrees. We're getting a quality stamp in exchange for being employable. That is one example of how authority has been sold. You're getting permits of all kinds. When you get a letter to the editor published, they are selling you authority. They are giving you space in the paper so you can put your words for more to see. And the reason authority was sold is that authority was scarce. Authority was scarce. And if you want a little taste of what society might look like in 60 years, there are three words that I think can sum that up. Authority is abundant. Authority is abundant. It's up to us and everywhere, everybody else in the world to create our future. We have the ability to do that. And that has never before been true in the history of humankind. So before I go to my final words, I'm going to do this little red, green, red, yellow, green play. So on, the, on a scale from ba to yay, and can I see a show of hands for red? For yellow and green. Oh wow, I have to take a picture of this. <laughs> Thanks, guys. That's makes, that makes she unhappy as well, Key unhappy as well. And so my final words before we part ways. Change doesn't just happen. It doesn't just happen. Somebody makes it happen. And with authority being abundant, the question I want you to go away with from this presentation is, do you want to be that person? And I'm hoping that your answer will be yes. Thank you. <laughs>